a welcome everybody to Stringstastic Facebook page. Here I have Joanne May from, I forgot which state you're from. I'm right in Illinois, Chicago. <laughs> from, <laughs> yes. Yeah, from Chicago, whoops. <laughs> okay, so today we'll be touching base in regards to Roland pedagogy, so solving 10 problems all teachers experience. And um, I met Joanne last year, it I feels like we're... forever. Yes, yeah. it does. Maybe, two, <laughs> maybe it was two years ago because we were in person in 2019, just before COVID hit. That's no, it was last year before the lockdown. Before yeah, before everything, it was yeah. last year March, right uh, before lockdown. In March, right, mm. right. So we were we were lucky to have that, that conference right. in Florida. Right. Yeah. Yes, right. we were. Yeah. So, so. Joanna, <laughs> welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Would you like me to just start in or do you want to ask questions or how shall we proceed? Um, maybe we can just start and then if anyone has any questions, they can just write down at the chat. I'll monitor the chat or um, okay. if anyone wants to reach out later, they can reach out. Okay. Well, I, I made a list of things that are common problems of students. Probably every string teacher, whether they're in their first year of teaching, studio uh, setup, or one on one, or uh, maybe 30th year in group instruction, and everything in between, um, have, have probably experienced some of these problems with their students. Um, a lot of times at the very beginning level, when students are so excited to start playing an instrument, they, they at least in our area, have the instrument delivered to their home instead oh, wow. of school. And when it gets delivered to the home and there's no instruction yet or knowledge about what to do, um, sometimes they open the case and they start and they pick up the instrument, maybe something like this. And because they think this is the way it goes and they go like, uh, something like this. So um, what, I'm, what I'm going to do is to start with the problems and then go into Roland pedagogy and how Professor Roland would have solved some of these problems. He was a brilliant, creative, pedagogue teacher of the best sort who always changed ideas as he, even even as i had him for three years as a student at the university of illinois he changed um my shoulder rest a whole bunch of times we've talked uh probably um maybe I, we've talked haven't we Lynn, yes about, uh, yes the chin rest uh, fittings with frisch and denig uh, lynn denig was a student of his and um we occasionally have that conversation amongst the the former students of roland about what did he do with you because he was always creative and thinking what could be better so i'll start with weakness i'm going to set my violin down because um you know so for those teachers that are not sure um you the shoulder rest and the chin rest can be changed and adjusted uh depending on the student so if anyone is interested i think joanne you've got a list of people around the globe that would I be able to find, I can get a hold of one <laughs> yes if anybody is interested in getting some information about those various other so many different types and shapes and sizes and heights and um what fits you know my my frame may not fit anybody else in the world so a, a, a custom fitting sounds like it's like the best you could ever get but it actually means it's the right thing for you and there are so many wrong ways to do it for for each person and each yeah student. So I was um, looking into this many years ago for a student because he's got a long neck. And yeah. at that time, we didn't have a lot of um, connections and resources in Australia. So right. it's good that if you've got a <laughs> connections and stuff, people would like yeah. to yeah. look be at Be happy it. to be try great. to put, put people together. I, I think yeah. that's really valuable. Um, so one of the first things that came to mind when I was thinking about problems is is weakness that the, the wrist collapsing the the chin holding the chin wrist out of fear of, of dropping it rather than having some, you know, good um, balance to the body. Um, not having enough strength literally in the hands or in the, the upper body. Um, I taught college level for uh, and, and in the U.S. colleges advanced um, instruction, not <laughs> not uh, younger people. Um, 
And so many times the, the young women were really having a difficult time with the strength of their upper body if they were not a string player and they were in a string techniques class for a music education degree and that was basically what i was teaching and so i would tell them that they needed you know come on strong women we need to <laughs> weights for our upper body because we're not naturally as gifted in in muscle development as as the guys and so a lot of a lot of our uh, conversation revolved around why are we getting so tired and how can we develop that? So, so uh, Roland has one uh, wonderful activity that pairs rhythm training with strength building, and that is called the case walk. So I have my case here, and I'm going to show you that he. If I stand up, and I'll probably have to change angles a few times here. He would have his students hold it, hold it like a like a platform here, like a tray maybe, and um, he would do, pair it with rhythm training by putting on some music and marching. So he would march with students, and if there there was a group, they would go march around in a circle. And at one point, if they were doing this. Um, each week, let's say he had a pedagogy class where students came once a week and we got to watch what he did with them. Um, after a while, this was just too easy. So their biceps are getting a little stronger. And then he would say, go to the side here and hold the side and now lift up as high as you can over your head and keep marching this way. And so marching to the rhythm of the music while, while walking. And if you got tired, the students who were younger maybe or not as, as strong would be able to go back down like this and um, doing it as a routine just like any athletic this is an athletic thing we're doing when we play the violin or viola or I used to have my cellists actually hold the cello up oh, over their yeah. head but I was a little nervous about that one so I only did it <laughs> Um, but but they could hold a case. Uh, there were some school instruments sometimes that we had extra cases and they could use that. Um, so that was one of his ideas to begin to have fun, to get oxygen moving through into the brain, to get students moving with music, understanding how their body functions and strengthening at the same time. And that idea then of holding the instrument quickly to put down the case and then pick up the instrument, it just feels like it's light as a feather now because oh, the wow. case is much heavier. I, I would also not have the instrument in the case. Yes. <laughs> well, in the case walk if you don't want to drop the instrument. So that means when you start, you start with forward holding and then expand it. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, just, yeah. Change it. Whatever too. they can manage to do, and it depends on how athletic and and active the the kids are. Some kids are really outside all the time, or they're always moving and uh, playing games and playing ball, and you know they're they're really active. And other kids are just sedentary and. <laughs> All they do is look at a screen. So their yeah. muscles aren't going to be as developed. Um, he also was concerned about their hands and developing strength in the hand. Um, I found this wonderful ball that's really soft. And so if I was, uh, I, I use balls for a variety of different things. I'll show so you. So that's like a there. stress ball? It's like a stress ball. It's about the okay. same amount of. Uh, of resistance when you squeeze. And I just found it, it was at an ASTA conference, I think, because it's, <laughs> who is it? It's the Salvation Army serving in 111 countries. They were giving away world balls. Um, I also, at, an, at another conference, I think this is an insurance company, but it's the same thing. It's the same, made out of the same material. So yeah. I, I think uh, you can get that from a $2 store. I think that's- Yeah, really yeah. yeah, I think so. Well, a lot of these things can be found at your, your local dollar store or other, you know, really low, ex low expense for, for this. <laughs> Um, so squeezing the ball and then uh, this, doing the same thing after doing that a few times with the resistance, then pick up the instrument and do some finger taps on the on the string, um, tap fingers here, and that 
really does help to strengthen, especially the large muscle of the thumb. This is always where the weak, weakness happens, which is connected right here, which is why this happens too. There's there's quite quite a lot of integration there in the in the muscles and the ligaments, tendons, joint, all of that. So, um, so those are a couple of ideas that I'm going to try to stick with Roland. I've come up with a few on my own, but over the course of my career, I hardly ever had an original idea. <laughs> I always just borrowed from people as I would see, you know, what they were doing for solutions. That's right. Now, so you're talking about all the beginners, right? So what about those that already have those bad habits and stuff? Could you still use that same method? Yes, you can, although it's really hard to unlearn um, the whole last portion of Roland's Teaching of Action in String Playing book is on remedial teaching. In other words, unlearning something and then relearning it. And he goes into quite a, a lot of detail about how you can approach it either almost like the think system. If you've seen the movie Music Man, they think how to play the instruments and everybody is supposed to actually play a Bach minuet and um, it sort of works. I, I don't think it's that's reality, but what's reality about about changing bad habits is that if you have, let's say, a, a problem with the wrist going this way a lot, um, there's weakness. So we want to strengthen the, the muscles. This, this movement forward, the flexing is a weakness in the inside of the forearm. So doing some forward squeezing is, is helpful. But uh, the other thing is if they've had this habit for a long time, it really takes what what Roland says is some mindful reprogramming of your brain. Mm -hmm. So if you've been doing um, lifting up the instrument this way, just what I just did, if you have it in rest position and your hand is like this and you've been picking it up this way, you're training over and over and over again this hand to do the wrong thing. So what you would do or could do is just approach it all together differently. And Roland's uh, idea of starting beginners is to put the hand here. And he calls this middle position, which is halfway between the end of the fingerboard. And um, so he ha has, has the students hold it in rest position here with a hand here. And then he does a statue, which also is that strength coming down to a relaxed position. And there's no way for the wrist to go like this because it the instrument is helping to hold it the way it needs to be held. And so starting, if, if it's possible to start beginners this way, you, you haven't developed a bad habit, but if there are players who've been doing this, and I, I was teaching um, 14 through 18 year olds, and they had been playing for several years before they would come to me. And sometimes they had some pretty bad habits. And so finding ways to get them moving, um, this middle position is a wonderful spot for starting in rest, plucking, turning it around while you pluck. If the fingers are active and then the arm can be active, there's no locking of that wrist. So that's just one uh, idea uh, of that he would say to to reprogram your way of thinking is to actually go back. It seems to students sometimes like, oh gosh, we're going back to the very beginning on how to hold this <laughs> way. Really? I've been playing for three years or five years or something. Um, doesn't matter. It's it, it's kind of uh, wonderful what happens when when the patterns of movement of the body can be adjusted to be more natural. If they're like this, that's not a natural thing. We don't do things like this. I mean, yeah. we might hold the tray up, but that's just for a real short time. And then our hands don't naturally go that way. So yeah. his whole uh, approach is to try to think and find what the body naturally does and then how we can apply this violin playing thing to the natural movements of the body. So. Okay. Now, um, I get my students to hold the body of the instrument to put up rather than over the fingerboard with the over the finger. Yeah, that, that was how I taught actually quite a lot. Um, so this way. Yes, here. that's right. And did you have them have their thumb like this or yeah. do, do they go up? No, over. 
this way? Yeah. Yeah. This is how I did it um, after going to several Suzuki workshops um, because I thought they would drop it if they were over here. Yes. I, I was a little worried that they couldn't get a good hold of it. Um, yeah. Every time I've seen young kids do it this way, they just do it like nothing. It seems like they have enough strength in their fingers to not drop it. So I would encourage to, to try starting this way with, it, especially if they're young children. If you think about, uh, I'm a parent of two and when the kids were born and then they were just old enough to hang on to your fingers and they were stretching, you know, almost not able to stand yet or, or take a step, but they were still really, really young. Um, they could hold on and you could lift them all the way up off the floor. Sure. <laughs> Their fingers are stronger at, than the rest of them. You know, the rest of their body is pretty not developed yet, but their fingers were strong enough. And that's what, that's what this is, is the fingers holding on. If you're concerned about it, try having them put their fingertips on the side over here, because they're actually, that encourages even better movement of the elbow into playing position. So let me back up just a little bit so you can see that a little bit better. So going from rest position with the fingers fingertips on the side thumb in the in the saddle some people call that curve of the neck the saddle i just always said thumb in the curve of the neck it can be uh slightly forward or back but it, it shouldn't be all the way that inside of the hand shouldn't be touching all the way so wherever it's comfortable though roland was big about let your fingers go and thumb go where it's comfortable to you. Again, it's this, it's the idea that they're, everybody's hand is slightly different. Mm -hmm. So starting in this position with the fingers on the side of the fingerboard, going up to the statue, helping by turning around, he would have them take the button, aim toward the center of the neck, but it might need to be a little bit here, a little bit there, whatever fits best. And here we are now, there's no way if I'm holding my fingers on the side of that neck, that my arm is going to go the wrong direction. This prevents bad, bad habits right off the bat. So um, he would do it first as, well, I, I can't even say first and second. One of the ways is the statue, bring the button around this way. And of course, you want to start with your feet and with a good balance, he would have the students feet a little bit apart shoulder width usually and um, then do statue as the foot steps out and then turn it around this way or the other way would be just with what i was doing before of plucking as you go slide this hand down to the button keep plucking this strengthens the fourth finger by the way this is another thing that roland did for strengthening and get the instrument into playing position. And now the natural thing is for the elbow to get involved. The whole arm is swinging and kids, when they get their arms swinging, they usually start moving their whole body, which releases tension. Uh, Roland's one of his all time, you probably remember this from that workshop that we did, um, is free from excessive tension. He's always yes. trying to get, uh, you have to have tension. You have to be able to hold the instrument, the bow, the, you, you draw the bow, you have weight in the string, you have lots of, um, there is pressure that comes from the first finger, the, all of those sorts of things are in play and they do require some tension. Mm -hmm. But free from excessive tension is what you wanna be when you play. So that is a way that he would, he would approach those, those problems with students that have developed really bad habits. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, now, what about, now, that works well with violin and, and violas. What about cellos and double basses? Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I would say uh, that a lot of the same problems, uh, I've worked with Joanna Wynn quite a lot. She is the former cello professor at Oberlin. Um, college in Ohio, and she's now a cello professor at Rowan University in New Jersey. And she had she and I were undergraduates together at the University of Illinois. She was 
in Roland's pedagogy class as a cellist. And uh, she has said, I can't even tell you how many times in workshops and various places we've been presenters, um, that it's the same for cello. It's the same for cello. <laughs> you know, if we're talking about swinging the elbow, for example, okay, it looks like this when you're on a violin or viola. And if you have tension in your shoulder, the, one of the biggest problems for cellists is this tension here. Well, it's the same big problem for violin and viola players too, is to relax that arm and get natural movement and strum this way across, you know, as you're holding the cello in front of you. Um, so, so I would say that if, if you're looking for specific information about cello and bass, um, use all of the principles, this is what Joanne would say, I think, and have everyone uh, just adapt to this this position as opposed to this position you know basically keep the body moving have relaxation in the shoulders let the large muscles initiate movement and then the smaller parts of the body follow that's called sequential motion and that's something that is uh it's an it, it intellectually it's an easy concept but it's really hard to do for people who haven't thought about it when they've been playing and it, it, it actually relaxes everything in the body and makes things flow rather than forcing movement so but that's a great question um i would suggest too if people are interested more in getting in touch with joanne michael finelli studied with roland he's the base expert on on roland pedagogy um and there are several others now who are cellists and bassists who are studying the pedagogy and ready to begin presenting and, and being mentors for people if they're interested. So there's there's a lot of good good activity going on in the Roland world these days. So uh, I can certainly, again, try to connect people if, if that is of interest to anyone. No, that'd be brilliant. So I'll get the details off of you later okay. and then I'll yeah. put that below. All right. Oh, so. Um, what's the next couple of stuff um i had uh tension in the left hand and arm especially with vibrato vibrato yes. is like this <laughs> thing that that uh i would say probably half the string teachers in my life that i've encountered throughout the course of my career um had really very little concept of how to teach vibrato so I kind of made it my thing because I had learned from Roland and there's a very clear pedagogy in his teaching of action book, step by step by step by step. He actually calls the chapter first steps in, I don't know if it's teaching vibrato or playing vibrato, but what he goes through isn't really just the first steps it's almost the whole thing um there there are uh lots of problems of tension when when if teachers that i've that i've known have done something like okay kids it's time for you to do some vibrato let's do it on one note you have to take all your other fingers off so independence of fingers should be some training prior to vibrato but Let's just say it isn't. So they, they're saying, take all your fingers off and now just wiggle that finger. Well, all sorts of things can happen if that's the instruction. Kids are very creative. You know, they'll, they might go, er, 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 er. they're wiggling the finger <laughs> just like you told me. Um, they might go this way. A lot of times we see that side to side thing. Look how much my instrument is moving though. Okay. Um, they, they might actually go the right direction but there's a problem right here. And the problem is that I'm locked in with this index finger tight against the side of the fingerboard and it's not allowing the vibrating finger to move very much. And so um, one of the first things that Roland would do for, for all of these tension related elements and the same things would be true here gripping having too many fingers down having a squeeze of the thumb for cello and bass um, is to tap he roland did tapping on both hands actually for bow and for left hand but um let's just see if you can let go of your thumb and tap it a couple of times and see just where it falls 
find a natural position for it to go. Does your thumb naturally want to go further back? Does it naturally like to go further forward? Is it more for me? You know, I'm a kind of a run of the mill, sort of in the middle, halfway between about where my first and second fingers would be. And so tap that thumb and release the excessive tension. Do the same with the first finger, do the same with the second finger, third finger, and fourth finger. And Roland was big about using a low four a lot, right from the very beginning. So um, there, he does lots of octave games with the third finger first, and then he goes right to low four things and finger patterns of the, of the one whole step two, half step three, half step four. Uh, variety. So, so tapping the fingers in rhythms, bouncing the fingers as if they're a ball, like boing, 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 boing. You know what that's doing is actually loosening up my grip here on the side of my index finger. And so um, the next thing would be then maybe do some tap, tap, swing, swing, tap, tap, swing, swing. Well, what I'm doing now when I swing is I'm completely letting go of my index finger. What I've found is if kids can keep that index finger completely away from the neck when they're first learning vibrato, then they can do it almost every time, almost every time. I rarely had a student who was not coordinated enough to get some kind of vibrato action, even without very much instruction, as long as what I, they had what I called a two-point contact. I would say the thumb is more under the neck now to help the balance. And now let's just put either second or third. I always would start with the middle of the hand because it's better balanced there. A lot of kids want to start with first finger. It's not a very good balance. And there's also not as much skin on that tip of the first finger right. typically as there is on the second or on the third. So I always had kids kind of look from the side how, how much pad do you see on the ends of your fingers? And maybe that'll help you decide if you wanna start with a second or a third finger. So doing some of the tap, tap, swing, swing can help release that index finger, the desire for it to be in contact there. I think the reason it's in contact so, so uh, severely in some students is because they've only known that one spot from the beginning. They've only played in first position, D, E, F sharp, G, A, if they've used four, a lot of times they wouldn't use four. They'd play a D major scale and they play every tune possible within the D major scale. All of that is a vice grip on this index. That's finger. Right. Yeah. So getting that to loosen up is something that Roland did right away with students. This going from Statue of Liberty position to swinging the elbow, you're already up here in the middle of the fingerboard. You're not stuck down here. The next step is to go back here. So, so he started in the middle and then went back to first. And then he called it middle and low, then back to middle. Now let's go up to high. Now we have to do something different. The hand opens up, but we're still basically moving the body in the same way with this elbow swing. So there's no vice grip if the students have been doing that from, I would say week two, probably. Week one lesson that is after the instrument is out and tuned and ready for an actual lesson is um, to get into playing position, Statue of Liberty. And then along with that will come a little bit of this left hand pizzicato. Second week, let's start shuttling around. And so when, when kids, uh, when you tell a high school student, we're going to play Sibelius second symphony um, finale, and you're going to have to go into ninth position, their eyes bug out like <laughs> because they've never heard of ninth position before, much less played in it. But if they've done this and this and this and this, they've been in, I don't know what that number is up there, but you know, 13th position or 15th position. They've been as far as the finger can go and even beyond. If you're a cellist or a bassist, you know there are all kinds of notes that are <laughs> past the end of the fingerboard. So uh, it's not new to them other than the terminology. 
now we're just going to call it ninth position. So, so all, I would say, you know, a lot of times people ask me, is role in pedagogy for beginners mainly? Because all the stuff in the Teaching of Action and String Playing book is how to do it from the beginning. And I always say, no, it's not just for beginners. Think about the absolute wonderful way you would feel if you could release some of the pain that you have when you play or the tension that you feel in your hand or your back muscles or your neck. You know, we have all sorts of um, stories about professionals who've had to can their careers after, uh, you know, abusing their bodies for years and years and years. And music medicine was, uh, you know, started a whole new um, study of what are musicians doing that are is harmful and how can they relearn some of those patterns of behavior. So that's, that's, that's why the pedagogy works so well with everyone, it doesn't have to be beginners. Ideally, it would be great to start in the beginning, but it's possible yeah. to use it at any level. For yes, and and in fact, I had uh, an interesting. Um, I, I was a college student when I met Roland and had him as a as a teacher, but because I grew up about fifty miles from Champaign Urbana, where I went to college, I had had uh, teachers in our area who had been participants in Roland's teacher workshops. And they would come back to my town and I had a, a lovely teacher when I was 10 years old. He's the first violin teacher I had. His name was Norman Werner and he was the sweetest man. And I didn't know where this was coming from. I never heard of Roland till years later. He said, you know, I'm a basketball player. And when we play <laughs> basketball, we pivot. We keep one foot in one place and the other foot moves all around. Well, that's what we're going to do on the violin. When we put our thumb here, we find the spot where it's going to go. And now we're going to slide our fingers up and down. And he taught me vibrato when I was 10 years old because it was Roland inspired he was going to these workshops with Roland and they used the pivot idea this is such a, a, a such a good analogy yeah. Roland was great with analogies and he used sports analogies a lot in the films I I think maybe you saw some of the films um I don't know have you seen the films I don't remember if we showed very much at that workshop but one of them was a tennis player the prep the hit and the follow through. It's a three part movement of the body. Same thing when you shift. If you're going to shift and go to, from a low position to a high position, go back a little, then go up and follow through by, you can add vibrato or follow through by having the finger land in on a, on a pitch. Um, so, so a lot of analogies uh, seem to work really well. And especially with younger children who won't understand the terminology and the vocabulary right. of yeah. physics of, you know, physiology, but they certainly can understand what a wet noodle is or how to, <laughs> how to pat a dog on the head, how to erase a small uh, word off of a, a chalkboard or a whiteboard though that's that's a pretty magical movement right there that i'm doing but don't tell them what they're doing just say this is the movement when like erasing a, a, a like salt shaking you know like like uh shaking a pop can and giving it to your friend that's what my high school students always liked to oh, cool. <laughs> uh but that that's that's also the one of the beautiful things about roland's pedagogy is that he has analogies all over the place no it works really well with me analogies yeah. rather than the big words we tend to use sometimes oh yeah now, um, in regards to the vibrato when we're teaching kids, because a lot of books tend to gear towards studying vibrato on third position. Okay. Would you immediately study on first position or would you? All over, yeah. all over the fingerboard. Um, the, the, uh, I'll show you some of the actions that he would do. I, I like, um, oh, I showed you the tapping and the tapping and swinging, but I found more success with this little tissue than anything. Um, I discovered that my students sometimes were very nervous in class. If it was, I, I mostly 
a classroom teacher. I have had lots of private students over the years, but um, even one on one, sometimes they would be nervous to play for me. You know, they 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 cared a lot and they wanted it to be good and they were afraid it wouldn't be good. And so um, I had a different teacher who used this phrase, but he said it was like they were so nervous that they left little puddles on the fingerboard oh. because their hand was sweating, you know. But so the tissue takes care of that problem. If you're trying to get them to move and be relaxed and they're trying so hard and they're, they're nervous and their fingers are sweating, it's it's counterproductive, but putting a tissue over the uh, over the strings and then doing this kind of movement is, is just beautiful. It just feels so nice. So that's one thing you can do it in always starting in this middle position, thumb in the saddle, curve of the fingerboard and just getting the arm involved. Roland taught often the whole arm vibrato first, but I always just said to my students, if the whole arm wants to move, let it move. If the wrist wants to do all that, all the moving, let the wrist do it because I always would say this, and it is true, the best artist musicians can do both. So do what comes naturally first, whatever is com comfortable to you, and do it about this speed. If you ask students, What's an adjective to describe vibrato? More often than any other word, they'll say fast. It's fast. But you know, this is not so fast. Don't think that it has to be this. When you see it and hear it, you perceive it as faster than it actually is. So, so go, I, instead of putting a metronome on, oh my gosh, one of the <laughs> greatest, uh, awful memories of, of learning how to do vibrato from a, a younger years before I met Roland was putting a metronome on and trying to go one, two, one, two, tick and tick and tick. And I hated that kind of practice. It's militaristic. It's rigid. It actually caused me to have more tension, I think. And so I say to my students always, just go the same as mine. You can hear it and you can see it. And that little whistly sound from the tissue is just beautiful. And my fingers are not on top of the string. You see how they're kind of in the in between the, right. the strings. And I'm using my middle two fingers because that's the center of balance of my hand. And I'm really relaxed in these fingers. You know, so you'll see all sorts of things with kids trying to do this stuff. So just keep it as relaxed as you can and just do it right here. And then when you're ready to Practice without your instrument, if you're bored in math class or something, hide your hands underneath the desk. <laughs> do this. Put your thumb in the palm of your, yeah. of your hand and do it this way. It's the same thing as the tissue. And then just touch if you want to touch two fingers. The nice thing about this one is that the skin moves on the back of your hand That's here. That's right. And it gives such a supple, lovely feel. <laughs> And then you can check and see, are you doing arm vibrato? Or, that's all I would ask a student. Are you doing arm or are you doing wrist? Which is it? It's one or the other. Is the whole arm moving? And of course, for cello, there's a difference. Cello and bass, it has to be arm. And by the way, you know, for us violinists, doing cello vibrato is not as easy. You see me? See? See what happened to my shoulders? I'm like, I got to do this right <laughs> uh, because I'm not as comfortable doing cello vibrato, although I can do it. And if you look at it really closely, when the hand goes down, the elbow goes up. It's a teeter-totter. I don't know. Do you have that? Do you have teeter-totters where there's a fulcrum here and one child will sit on this end and the other child on a seat on this end and they push off this way? Yes. That, that's what's happening when you're doing this cello vibrato or when you're doing the arm vibrato for violin and viola. I think we call teeter totters as, um, what do you call them? We don't call them teeter totters. We call them a seesaw. Seesaw, that's right. Seesaw. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. Yeah, that's, and that's the, that's actually in one of the Roland films. He has two kids on, on the end of one of those and they're doing this and going back and forth. Well, that's, that's what salt shaking and doing um, fast bow, bow strokes, <laughs> string crossings, things like that. We have that same thing going here as we do here. So why not just practice both of them at both. the same time? Especially if you're doing a lot, you're, you're working on vibrato, but you're right-handed. A lot of times students would say to me, but I'm right-handed. I can't do that with my left hand. 
So we do it with both first because the right hand is dominant and it will help guide the left hand, the left arm motion. Erase those little board, words off the board first so that it's out there. And then turning it around is the tricky part. So we just do it kind of gradually with both and go just go sideways this way with both hands. And once you get this sideways thing going, then drop the right hand and see if the left will steep, keep moving. So, so having help from, from you know, the right, the dominant hand, whichever that is. Um, so those are a couple of, of ways I, I would tell students to just practice this under their desk or you know, when they're yeah, watching TV or riding <laughs> in a car or something. Um, then uh, they can turn this, this arm around if they, you know, if they feel like they want to do more than just this and they've got this down pretty well because this is a nice, comfortable movement for a lot of people. They don't even know they can do this just really gradually, just like with the violin, when I picked it up from rest position and I was strumming, 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 strumming into playing position, do the same with this vibrato, gradually moving, 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 while still vibrating into a violin playing position. And now I'm actually going the right direction up and down the string, you know, yeah. eventually turning that around. So there's a lot that can be done outside of, of having the instrument. Um, uh, two others I want to mention, knuckle knocking and bump finger. And I don't think Roland used those terms, but he has these actions in his book. Um, knuckle knocking is to check for even movement. And that is to get the instrument into playing position. You've strummed so that your, your, your side of your index finger is nice and loose and free. And now we're gonna actually bump against, with our knuckles against the outside peg. And what we're doing here is just feeling for evenness. If we do, you know, if, you, if there's some of that real uneven, unevenness going on, then put the instrument aside and do more of these types of, of movements to so get if, the body trained. So with that movement, it's more of like a free arm without locking anything yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And actually if the thumb comes off, it's okay for a while. I mean, eventually the thumb's going to stay in place, just like the fingertip is going to stay in place. But when we're doing these movements, if the thumb is moving, it's fine. If it comes off a little, it's fine too. And it's really to just train these muscles. You know what we're doing is we're actually training this part of our body. It's not it's not here where it's, where it's hard. It's back here that we have to be able to go. See all this movement here? In, in Roland films, he actually puts straps with long <laughs> poles on the biceps of, of some of the players or down near the elbow. And, and look at how much movement there is on this little post or pole that comes out from this bicep. It's because he's making a point that the whole body has to be involved in this. We cannot just teach vibrato by, by saying move from the wrist and hold everything else steady still because it just won't work. That's not, the body isn't designed to separate out and have little movements of this and a little movement of that. Um, so knuckle knocking is one. And the other that I wanted to show you is, I call it bump finger. I don't know what else to call it. I take, um, when I've gotten to the point where I can actually stick, stick my thumb and stick my finger and have a decent vibrato movement here, I'm going to check to see if it's even by laying my right hand onto the top of the instrument. And I'm not going to move my right hand at all. I'm going to point toward the joint, the first joint, first knuckle here. And I'm going to move the vibrato and bump into my finger. And I can feel it is such, it's more powerful than the knuckle knocking because the peg is what's what you're bumping into but here it's my finger bumping into my other finger and it's just like i can tell exactly how even it is and and it's really uh, it's really a tactile thing that's very helpful and so roland has that uh, as a suggestion it's just he he just thought of everything i don't know how he was able to come up with such creative ideas but i've used these these uh, strategies for 
let's see, 43 years of teaching and oh, wow. they work. I know they work. So it's really worth a try if you haven't tried some of them. Um, I have a few more things. Do, do, do you want to keep on going down the list or how are we doing for time? Yeah, we've got time. We've got time. Maybe okay. about 15, 20 more minutes. Okay. Um, so vibrato, I, I wanted to make sure and, and do that. Uh, I would like to talk about a crooked bow. Has anybody ever had a student that had a crooked <laughs> bow? I think everybody. <laughs> I'm going to stand up for this and actually would invite people to stand up um, to do this little activity with me without the instrument first, um, just moving side to side and then getting to um, a point where if you can begin to swing your arm, let's take the bow arm, the right, the right arm, in the opposite direction of the body. Okay, so that's what Roland called bilateral motion. And that means that when the body is going one direction, the bow is going the bow opposite. Arm yeah opposite okay so two two directions at the same time and back to center so um we uh, sometimes we'll start this bilateral motion by having students pick up a case uh, with the instrument in it or or not and just sw start swinging the case down at their side and and let their body just respond to whatever the swing is well what's happening if you look at it from the side my body is going the opposite way of my hand. It's a natural thing for the body to do because of the weight of the case being back there. My body needs to counterbalance by leaning yes. forward and then go the opposite way back and forth. Okay, so that's the that's the principle involved, and he called it bilateral motion. And so you know you can do it standing, swinging this way. But when it comes to actually doing something with the instrument, we want to begin maybe with a position of the arms. As you see, he did a lot of this sort of thing. Start up higher and come down, and it feels so comfortable, rather than pick it up and, oh, this is really fun. <laughs> so starting higher and coming down. And now let's just pretend like we're going to pluck one of the strings and come back around sort of in an elliptical shape this way. And when we pluck, the natural thing, if we, if we push that arm out there, the body wants to go the opposite direction for that counterbalance. And we can actually encourage more movement just by a little more body sway. And this movement is so relaxed and so easy. And Roland called it flying pizzicato. So teaching students this flying pizzicato is, a, is maybe the next step. After doing all of this, get your instrument in position, using middle position, shuttling back to low, middle, and maybe even high if your students, if you think they're coordinated and ready. Notice I'm holding here the whole time. I don't yes, want to drop. Yes, I was going to mention <laughs> <laughs> then the next thing I would do, just leave this hand here, have a rooftop so that this, the fingers aren't touching the strings, and then just pluck and do some flying pizzicatos and make that nice elliptical shape. I'm actually aiming a little bit toward the front because when I do this movement, my body is going this direction. I'm going to do it slowly. And I'm, I am moving my right arm toward the side, but not very much because I'm helping by moving my body toward the other side. So it's actually, he said, it's almost like you feel like you're coming out from the center of your body, draw a line down the center of your body and come out. And so that he did often all the strings doesn't matter you know kids are like oh no which one which one we don't want to even be worried about that at this point we're just trying to pattern some movements so flying pizzicato it can be done about medium to slow speeds i wouldn't go that's 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 a that gets into a faster speed which is in a, the realm of balanced movements as opposed to bilateral movements so that's that's uh flying pizzicato and then the next step after that they have to learn how to hold the bow and there are all sorts of ways to do that and without going into that let's assume that they've 
really got a nice bow hold and they've done flying pizzicato and now it's time to do some some bows and actually it could even be smaller movements and they're little circular movements they're going down and up down and up and as the bow lengthens they turn into ellipses longer and longer but all the while you see what's happening with these with this body it's constantly in motion because why because i don't think i could do it without excessive tension if i held still i just can't even breathe right now I, <laughs> my breathing got shallow my knees locked up because I was trying to hold still. Sometimes we make the mistake. I'm a parent and I told my kids to hold still a lot. Hold still, I need to braid your hair. Hold still and tying your shoes, hold still. So kids have heard that a lot and they need to be given the freedom to move and to move in a comfortable, natural way and then learn how that applies to the pizzicato movement and then the bowing. The bowing one is Roland calls rebound. And the rebound strokes, he says, just do little tiny ones at first and start at the balance point is, is a comfortable place. He has an early bow hold that's here at the balance point that you only do for a few weeks. You don't wanna stay there very long, but it makes the bow almost weightless. So doing it here, just, just above the hand is a really nice beginning for rebound the hairs you feel how soft they are and what that's training you to do is to have a shape to your tone we don't do uh 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 we don't start and stop start and stop start and stop a lot of teachers teach that way we do shapes right from the very beginning strokes and we do that little tiny short bow stroke with an early bow hold and it feels just soft as a as a cloud almost where my hand is and then the next lesson we might move one inch down closer to the frog and we'll play that way for a week and then the next lesson maybe another week closer and then finally we find where the thumb bumps into the frog so and then gradually lengthening the rebound strokes to be to be longer and that's that's it. If students can learn, you know, it's it's almost like magic because if students have been struggling with some of these things, like the straight stopped bow stroke, trying to get a, a staccato sound or martelle or something that they're trying to do. The only what I'm doing is not straight i can't even do it i was doing, <laughs> i was doing martelle because there's that pop and that release and that's a curve it's a curve it's not a straight line and and so teaching students from the very beginning with those rebounds how to do the curves it's it's it, a, a beautiful transition then over to some of the more advanced bow strokes that they'll need to be able to do so um that also that also alleviates the crunchiness of the tone you know i i did suzuki teacher training and the teacher long ago this is long ago um was a mom who decided she loved what she was learning in her daughter's lessons and she took her own teacher training even though she had never played the violin before she was a mom and she was going to these lessons so to her credit she really had a steep learning curve of how to play the violin and then she was really articulate very bright woman and then she became a teacher trainer so i took my first two levels with her at that time it was just called pre-twinkle and twinkle and it was through some summer programs and it was wonderful to hear what uh, what she was doing and um then came the time when she said something that made absolutely it was absolutely the opposite of what i had learned from roland pedagogy because i was post-college i was learning from a mom who hadn't had very much training and she was just saying what she had been told and um somewhere along the way she heard that you're supposed to really lean way back as far as you can try to get a straight bow and she was having us do that i have a picture of myself that's why i remember so well because i was i was probably 23 or something and and here here are all these people in this room and somebody took a picture and we're leaning way back like arching our backs as far as we could go to try to get that idea of of 
flying pizzicato, really, that's what it was. And I knew flying pizzicato, but I had never heard it done where you're straining painfully the you know other parts of your body and so um so you know wherever you go wh whoever you have learned from teachers have many uh, uh, mentors and many teachers that they've studied with um take the good stuff and use it the best that you can in your own special way um uh, sometimes I'm working with teachers who are, are going to be Roland mentors and, and they're concerned that they're not going to say it the Roland way. And I just can't encourage people enough to say things and learn things and apply what you're learning for your student. What does your student need? What are those maybe like you had mentioned before, Lorena, the 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 bad habits that they may have developed or what is happening with their family get to know them become their mentor but even i that word is is used so often that it can be mis misinterpreted i think uh, as a teacher that i'm actually a, a member of their family i i love my students i have them for years i don't just have a student for a semester or a year like most other teachers i have them for long time and i get to know their families and i had a kindergartner five-year-old uh step on her violin one time and crush it <laughs> in a lesson yeah and she went oops and we and that's all she said was oops and then she broke down in tears I, of course, had to call. It was my fault. I was having them lay their instruments on the floor so that we could do some movement. And sure enough, I didn't even think that she was going to turn around and step on it. And um, I had to call mom and dad and talk to them. And um, they were very understanding. And the music store was very understanding. And so, you know, it all worked out in the end. But we laughed about oops for years after that. I, I think I had the student from the age of five till probably 10 or 11, something like that. And so you develop those relationships and then you do what you know is best for those kids and what's best for your mentors and peers and you approach them graciously if you see a colleague for example who um i had this happen a, a colleague who was uh teaching something that was completely tense I, I don't remember now what it was but i do remember standing at the back of the room watching this teacher teach a group and after after the kids were all gone I said, so let's talk about this. I I have uh, noticed this. Is this how you blah 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 blah? You know, it's not comfortable always, but if you approach it with grace, people are usually willing to listen and 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 you know uh, appreciate that somebody is actually watching what they're doing in the profession that they've chosen that they love. And I don't know anybody who doesn't want to improve if it's in a profession that they love to do. So, so that's something that I've also um, been able to see happen in my life, in my career. And it's, and it's really gratifying because think how many students she is affecting now in a more positive way. And um, so, you know, it goes on and on it goes with, with more and more students and more and more they become teachers themselves. No, it's good. Like, um, like you said, it's getting ideas and kind of changing it to suit your teaching style. I think, um, like I wouldn't have used the the basketball analogy with my students because most kids that I I teach don't know basketball <laughs> that much, you know. So yeah. it's just changing the way you explain things yes. that suits the, the student itself. Absolutely, yeah. And and I think. Uh, watching especially just the first couple of films that roland put together um even though they're from the 1960s and early 70s the clothing and the hairstyle if you can get <laughs> past that um he used dancers and i mentioned the tennis player he has a golfer swinging a club to talk about the prep 
the action and the follow through. He has uh, somebody riding a motorcycle talking about not starting, starting sound suddenly. And he goes, and it revs the, the engine of the motorcycle and almost falls off as, as the motorcycle goes, you know? So I think that's a lesson for all of us. Don't just go with what your own experience is, but find things that connect with your students if they're interested in something that you've you don't know very much about but you might understand the physics of it that would connect with like wet noodles uh, my mom was a nutritionist and she always cooked we never hardly ever went out um, and so i i can relate to wet noodles you know i can see her picking them up out of the pot and just checking tasting one to see if it's done and <laughs> Uh, but there are other people who may not understand that. I, I would say, you know, make your hands like wet noodles, but some kids may not really understand that. So finding two or three ways to say, say the things uh, using imagery that will work for them is, is it's part of the challenge of, of being a teacher. And that's part of the art of being a teacher as opposed to it being a science. Yeah, uh, no, I love it. It's, it's finding new words, finding new ways to explain one particular um method or activity it's yeah brilliant. yeah great fun yes. for me <laughs> it is fun it's challenging in a way that uh, i i can't think of anything else that that is as challenging it's just uh it's just fun and and it's so fun when the students eyes light up because they you see a light bulb <laughs> yeah absolutely so yeah well okay so was that well, everything that I, I, was, uh, let me see. I, have I know there's more <laughs> yeah oh there's so much more um That's right just uh a lot of uh, vibrato is one thing and the other thing is bow control and i think yeah. i hit on both of those and in in thinking about the the movement um poor bow tone quality is often a, a result of of not understanding those curves and i'll show you one may i show one more thing yeah yeah, yeah sure okay one more thing uh, that roland does uh for the bow control and for tone production is called um it's called place and lift it's it this also seems so simple i'm gonna do it with the early bow hold up here at the balance point and um he'll have the students once they can do this and have a little bit of flexibility we're not going to ask them right at the beginner stage to do very much moving of the fingers but relaxed movement the bow is always in motion it's not a static hold it this way a bow hold is not what we do it's a bow hold with movement so um he would once they get to this point he would have them set the bow on the string silently and just lift it up <laughs> it's right. so yeah. simple but if you do this and you do it with a relaxed shoulder my blouse is sticking up a little bit <laughs> the isn't really that high i don't know i didn't notice that before um so having this movement just laying the bow right there at the center and letting your fingers act as little trampoline springs we have a neighbor that's right there and they have a really long yard and they always put a trampoline out in the summertime and I see those springs on the trampoline I don't know that analogy will work for some but um, maybe there's something else like a diving board I'm getting ready to dive I'm gonna spring off I went swimming a lot when I was a kid I explained so. that like jumping off the ground yeah Mm -hmm. little grasshopper pop popping yeah. up yeah so having this movement this look how much movement there is in my little finger you know that place and lift just silently do it in the center of the bow and then and then try it a little bit away from the center and then try even farther but notice every time my fingers are acting as springs and my arm is just as relaxed over here as it can be i just feel like i could fall asleep <laughs> because it's so comfortable and doing it at the balance point and then gradually again you know an inch a week moving down toward the frog that place and lift then turns into that rebound understanding how that feels notice my my whole body i can't do this like it's just like before i can't do this without moving ah i just want to move and it 
makes all of that so much easier than once they're ready to start lengthening out those strokes. So place and lift is another one that I would highly recommend from a very early stage or do it if it's even like way late in somebody's career and they're having a little trouble with this tension in the bow hand. You know, we see all kinds of weird things happening sometimes in the tension of the bow hand. So that's a good one. Great. Thanks for all that. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. And, and uh, I hope it's helpful to people. And as I said, if you hear from some who want to be connected, just uh, let me know and I'll do my best at putting them in touch with the right person. Yeah, no, um, I remember I seen um, you posting a couple of um, stuff on your Facebook page. I think you've done a lot of videos in terms of little activities. So if anyone is interested to look you up on YouTube. Yes, uh, Joanne May violin and viola videos. Yeah, it's a triple V. So um, those are uh, there are 60 five, I think right now, I haven't made any lately because I've been doing some other things and traveling and teaching, uh, but I will get back to it. So if people are not finding what they want, I like for people to contact me and say, could you do a video on this or on that? So that I know that it's a practical thing and some useful That's bit funny. of information. And I tried to keep them around one to three minutes and they're mostly five to eight, but, but no, I understand. <laughs> they are short. It doesn't take a lot of doing and, um, and people have used them in various ways. I'll, I'll tell the story about my daughter because she's a junior high, um, orchestra teacher, sixth, seventh and eighth graders. And all through COVID last year, when they were not in person, she had them watch those videos and then recreate one of she got they got to choose what to recreate and they had to include every step but a lot of it is role and pedagogy step by step first do this then this then this and oh my goodness some of them are so cute she had to show me just mom this this little guy's gonna be a teacher i can tell you know <laughs> the way they they took it so seriously but uh she went back in person just uh in september this year or end of august and she said, they play better now than, than a year ago. And a lot of teachers were not saying that because of the online teaching only that, that had been going on. So she feels really good about those steps made a lot of difference. And now she can take them to the next level. Some advanced string crossing, some of the shifting patterns, some of the three octave scales she's doing with, with kids who've only played for three years maybe. So it's wonderful that it is working so well and, and other teachers have just used certain ones, you know, just like I had my favorite role in films that I watch. I think, you know, it's, it, they're all, all subtitled with what the topics are, so. Okay, so I'll, I'll put that on the link below so if anyone's interested or uh, a bit lost and then they can reach out to you personally. And I think, was it Joanna's, the one that's doing the cello thing? Uh, Joanne Irwin. Joanne Irwin. Let me write that yeah. down before I forget. Uh, right. I can send you her contact too. Yep. We'll do that. And that will okay. be really helpful for everyone. So thank you so much for taking this time to share. I, I know there's a lot in Roland. When I was in um, your session, it was like mind blowing. It's like, wow, there's so yeah. much in it. And, uh, yeah. you know, there's, there's a couple of things that I already use myself without classifying it as a Roland pedagogy per se. Well, and it's it's just out there to be used. We, we hope that it will be helpful in a small way or a big way. And um, we've developed this certification program for levels of certification and post certification presenter training and mentor training. And so we have a, a, a pretty good crop of people who are studying it now and, and getting, you know, getting through the levels, uh, not only in the US, but I had a whole European group last summer, um, all, all over Western Europe. So there are lots of people interested. And I think it's because it works so well. They, they realize so, 
body. So can... for those, yes, yeah, for those interested, would they be able to do this course online through Will and Pedagogy? We, we're working through that. I'm on the certification <laughs> committee and we're, we, we had our first full summer uh, levels one through four last summer. We, we were, that's how recent it has been developed that level four was offered for the first time last summer. So now we're having actually meeting this week uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, future and what we'll be doing next summer. And I can pretty safely say, yes, there will be quite a few offerings online. I don't know if everything will be online, but we uh, certainly will hope that people would take a look. Um, there is a Roland Pedagogy website, and I can send you all of that contact too if people want to find more about it. Uh, the Roland Facebook page. Uh, also, we'll have advertisements about different activities that are going on. So, okay, brilliant, great, right. lots of information for everyone oh, whoever's thank interested. You, Lorraine, fantastic, uh, thank you so much, Joanne. It's so nice to see you again. Yes, likewise, and I shall see you next time. Hopefully, the um, life. Hopefully, I we can travel. Hope. Now. <laughs> I hope. All right. All right. Have a good one. So, thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.